I have said this every Sunday that I have preached this series, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to reiterate it and say it again. This series has the tendency to change your life, but only if you apply the principles from the Word of God to your life. And if you will apply those principles, it is amazing what God will do. But James tells us, don't merely just listen to the Word of God and do what? And so deceive yourself, but do what it says. So I'm going to encourage you, if you have not heard all of these fit together, there's four of these that fit together, all of these fit together in a very specific way. If you have not heard them, go online and look, go to our Facebook app. You can go to, to our, our app on Facebook and, and it'll take you right to the messages and you can catch up with anything and you can learn about everything that's going on. And so I want to, I want to dive into week four of Untangled. How many ever have tangled up something in your life and made a mess out of it? My dad uh, was working on his LTD Ford. Anybody ever have a Ford LTD? Man, I drove one to Bible school, four-door Ford. I was the stud on campus, let me tell you. That was the coolest car there. You know why it was the coolest car there? Because we could pile 15 people in it and go from Waxahachie to Dallas. I'd always get in there and say, okay, everybody, I need about two or three bucks to put gas in this thing so we can get there and back. But dad was working on a, uh, a car in the driveway and it was a few, the water pump had gone out. So we were working on that. It was a Saturday and, and uh, he could not get the bolts to line up. And so he said, Ron, get under there and see if you can do it. And, and I get under there and we put that thing on, we take it off. We put it on, we, take, we could not get it. And dad said something to me that I thought made a lot of sense. Well, just apply a little bit more pressure to it and see if you can force it. I'm not sure if that's always the best idea. So we lined that water pump up there and, and I was twerking it with everything I had. And, and I go, Dad, I don't think it's lining up. And he said, come on, put a little bit more elbow grease behind it. And all of a sudden it went and it gave. Busted my knuckles, everything. I said, Dad, I don't think we have any threads anymore. He goes, let me look. We busted the whole part of the engine off that the water pump attaches to. That's a mess. That is a mess. He looked at it and he goes, well, that's going to be a lot more expensive than what I thought. <laughs> Isn't it amazing how we can get into things and sometimes we think it's going to be a simple fix? Sometimes we can dive into things and we can think, I can do this and it's going to be okay. And there's a lot of times we will dive into things and we will mess things up. We will tie things up. We will tangle things up. And sometimes the things that we do in our life, we end up carrying out of that situation, out of that circumstance, out of that thing. We end up walking out of that with a tangled mess going, wow, how did I get myself there? There's so many times that I have looked back at my life and I think, knowing what I know now, if I could go back and do things different, boy, I would do things different because sometimes the mess is that we get ourselves involved in. There's baggage that we carry around for the rest of our life. There's scars, there's wounds, there's hurts, there's, there's things that happen. And as cruel as life can be, I've discovered something. My God. Can somebody say my God? My God. Not my God. My God. My God. My God sits on the throne. I've discovered something. He's bigger than my messes. He's bigger than my circumstances. He's bigger than the funky times that I find myself in where I just kind of blew myself out. He's bigger than those things. And if we will give God control of our lives, it is amazing through the principles, through the word of God, through the Holy Spirit that's working in us, God wants to help us untangle the messes that we get ourselves into. So as we dove into this, talking about untangled, I'm going to just briefly recap what we've looked at over the last three weeks. If Jesus could walk into our lives, if he could walk into this auditorium today, if he could walk into our situation and our circumstances, what is it that he would look at in your life? What is it that he would look at in, in what you are going through? What is it that it would look at 
that he would look at you and he'd say, that breaks my heart that you have got yourself into that situation. What is it that breaks the heart of God to the point that Jesus would say, I want to walk into your life and I want to help you untangle that mess. You see, I believe what, what he wants to do is, we talked about it in the, fir the first week of this, is he would want to untangle indifference, a spiritual indifference. It is that where I talked about, we've kind of turned into that eh, generation. Well, how are you doing? Eh, I'm okay. Hey, how's your church? Eh, how's your spiritual life? Eh, how are you doing? Eh, you know, it's just, nah, it's just, you're not hot and you're not cold. You're just indifferent. And I think if God would, could walk into that indifference that, that we sometimes find ourselves in, he would want to untangle that because the word of God tells us that he would, he would if you're lukewarm, I mean, it, it just makes him sick to his stomach. And the Bible says literally that that, that lukewarmness that we have in our life, that nah, kind of personality, it makes God so sick that he wants to throw up. Now, that, that's a pretty picture, isn't it? There's a purpose and a reason for hot things. There's a purpose and a reason for cold things. But when we're pursuing God, God says, I'd rather you be one or the other and not eh, spiritually indifferent. The second thing that I believe that he would want to undo is a hollow worship. See, what God, I think what really upsets him is lip service, where we say one thing and we do another thing. The Bible tells us to offer our bodies what? A living sacrifice. And the problem with the living sacrifice is what? It has a tendency to get up and walk off the table. And we're to die daily to the things of God. And what God wants more than anything is he want, doesn't want hollow, hollow worship where it is just lip service or we just come in and we go through the routine and we go through the motions because we understand how church operates or how our Christian life operates. What God wants is he wants a, a dedication, a real life sacrifice of praise of your life. What kind of a sacrifice? One that's pleasing, holy, and acceptable unto God. So what would he untangle? He would untangle this hollow worship. The last week, I loved last week, uh, we talked about hypocrisy, that, that fake, that putting on a mask. Uh, he would want to undo the, the people that are one thing here and another thing over here. He would want to get rid of the hypocrite that, that kind of has a tendency to lay down inside of each and every one of us. And so if he could untangle anything, it would be hypocrisy. Well, today as we, as we wind this up, I want to talk to you about spiritual pride. I think if there's one thing that if he could really untangle in our life, it would be spiritual pride. I want to tell you a personal story. I, I had a story I wanted to tell about my wife, and then I thought, I have to go to bed with her tonight. <laughs> so I decided not to. That smart, I'm not as dumb as I look. Don't anybody say amen to that. <laughs> Mom? Okay. But I wanted to tell a story, and I thought, I'm going to back up and just tell one on me. Now, I don't know about you, and, and if, you're, if you're with me, agree with me, okay? Man, I hate being told what to do. Yes. Anybody there with me? It's almost like that sand that gets in your shorts at the beach. <laughs> it just rubs me the wrong way. You know what I mean? I don't like being told what to do. That's probably the reason why Mom wanted, wanted, she didn't, but she wanted to beat me black and blue growing up. That's probably why my teachers talked about me in the teacher's lounge to all the other teachers. There's something wrong with that kid. I just never liked being told what to do. And so God is really having to work on that. Anybody... Just to make me feel good, okay? Does anybody have an issue in your life that you feel like God is still working on you? He's still knocking off those rough edges. Anybody there? Anybody, anybody here a saint? Okay, so, so we're all in the same, the same. So I think God is still having to knock some rough uh, edges off. And there's, there's just those, those moments where, where you think you've got it under control. I've got this. I can do this. 
And then your better half, there's a reason why they call your other half the better half. And then your better half walks in and she has the gall to point out my faults in my plan. Now, I think I am directionally challenged. And one of the biggest issues with me is driving. I, I, now, when I'm by myself, I can generally get to where I want to go generally, okay? There's times I go, I'm supposed to be at 34th and Bell. Why am I on Georgia? You know, one of those things. But I can get in the car and we can begin to talk. And the next thing I know, Shannon's like, weren't you supposed to turn back there? Everything in me wants to say, well, no, I know where I'm going, <laughs> right? I know exactly where I'm going, but I think the Holy Spirit speaks through my wife and it begins to prick my heart. And usually I don't know where I'm going. I just don't like to be told what to do. And, and is anybody, the hardest thing in the world for me to have to learn how to do was to look at her and say, Honey, you were right, and I was. I was. Honey, you were right, and I was. Wrong. Anybody there? I think that's what we call a pride issue. But there's so many times I've had to go back to Shannon and say something like this Honey, you were right. You were right. I don't like being told what to do. And so I think God still is knocking those rough edges off. But I do know that as God is knocking the rough edges off, when I truly listen to those who love me and I listen to those who can speak into my life positively, it makes me a better person. Now, we've all heard this said before, and you say it with me. I'm going to put it on the screen so you can see it. Pride comes before a what? A fall. Pride comes before a fall. It comes from Proverbs 16, 18, and it says this, pride goes before destruction and haughtiness or a haughty spirit before a fall. We've all been there and we have all experienced it. So if Jesus could walk into our situations, this pride that, we, that, that all of us probably face in some way, form, or fashion, if Jesus could walk in, he would probably want to un un untangle this, this spiritual pride issue that sometimes we fall ourselves in, find ourselves in, and we fall into. And why is that? Because he doesn't want us to experience the fall that comes after pride. He would really like to see us not have to go through that fall. He would really like to see us not have to get tangled up in that mess. So what would he do? He would untangle spiritual pride. What is spiritual pride? Spiritual pride is simply this, and you may want to write this down. It is a misplaced sense of worth or value. I'm going to read that again. It is a misplaced sense of worth or value. Now, as we get going, I want to tell you one of the most loving things anyone can do for you is to look you straight in the eye and tell you the truth. I would much rather tell somebody tell me that loves me that I've got spinach in my teeth before I go out in public and talk to people and go, uh, 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 and look like an idiot. You know what I mean? I would much rather have somebody tell me the truth, even though it might be, oh, I'm so sorry, embarrassing. I would much rather hear the truth. That's what God's word is going to do today. God's word is going to speak truth into your life. But if you have an issue in any way, form, or fashion with a pride or a spiritual pride, sometimes the truth has a tendency to rub you the wrong way. I've had people walk out of church and say, well, good lands, pastor, you stepped all over my toes today. I'm like, I didn't step on your toes. I just preached the word of God. Let the Holy Spirit do what the Holy Spirit. I'm just the messenger. Don't, so don't shoot the messenger. Sometimes the truth hurts. 
Sometimes hearing the truth is painful. When it pinpoints an issue or when it pinpoints a problem that is in our lives. But that change, that truth that can be spoken into us, when we listen to it, when we take it, that truth can bring a change. That truth, it can bring a difference into our lives. And this is the problem with truth. Are you ready? We tend to look at truth as criticism. We tend to look at truth as criticism. And almost all criticism, doesn't matter if it comes from a bad place or a good place, there is an element of truth in a criticism that is spoken into our life. And almost all criticism can turn into constructive criticism when we take it and we begin to view it through the Word of God, when we begin to filter it through the right filter, the Word of God, when we begin to take that, that criticism or that truth, that constructive criticism, that word that has been spoken into our life about an action or something that's in us or, or what we're doing, when we filter that through the Word of God and we take that, and you may look at the person and say, oh, that just, oh, that chaps my hide that you just said it to me. But then we can walk off and we can go, oh, but I really am that way. And they're only speaking the truth. They just didn't say it with kind words, but they're just speaking the truth. So change comes, true change comes. When we take the truth, true change comes when we take the truth of the word of God and we begin to filter anything and everything that is, is coming at us and we filter it through the word of God. Does it line up with what you're saying? Does it line up with the word of God or does it not? And when we filter this, then we can find true change. What would Jesus want to untangle? I believe he would want to untangle a spiritual pride that some of us find in our life. Now, there is a story that I want to tell today from Luke chapter 18. And in Luke chapter 18, Jesus is telling a story about these two guys. There's two guys, and they're going to the exact same place. And there's two guys that, as they go to the same place, they're going for the exact same purpose, okay? One is a Pharisee, and you can say, yay, a good guy. The other one is a tax collector, and you can say, boo, a bad guy. They're going to the temple. They're going, you could say, to church. Or you can put it this way. There's a good guy and a bad guy. They're walking into the, the, the earthly, physical presence of God. That's what the church is represented here. So they're walking into the presence of God. And why are they going into the presence of God? It literally is they are going to pray to God and what Jesus is going to tell us is he's going to tell us what these two men pray. Now, these two guys are going to leave. They both go to the same place, church. They both go for the same reason to pray, or you could say for us today, for the same reason to worship. They both leave that place, and they both leave completely different. One leaves good, and one leaves bad, and the one that leaves bad is not the one you think it would be. So we're going to dive into this in Luke chapter 18 and starting in verse nine. And it says this to some who were confident of their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. Jesus told this parable. This is a story. Jesus is meeting with some people and he's not meeting and telling this story to everybody. It's not a sermon for everybody. It's a very specific message that is being told to a very specific group of people that are meeting in a place and they're doing a very specific thing. And Jesus says, you have become too confident in who you think you are. You have become religious instead of righteous. And in your religion, you are looking down your noses on people. And this message, 
I'm not speaking to the crowds and the multitudes. This message, I am speaking to those that have come to the house for an experience. This is who I'm talking to. And Jesus begins to tell this story as he's talking to them. And he's basically tell them, telling them, you're looking down your noses at people. The very people that Jesus, the very people that God the very people that you are supposed to be ministering to and leading to the cross of Christ, that hasn't happened yet, but you know what I'm saying, leading to the cross of Christ, the very people you're supposed to be introducing to God, you have become so overconfident in how good you think you are that you're looking down your noses at the very people you are supposed to be loving. The very people that you are supposed to be introducing to God. You are coming to the house of worship for what? For what? To look down your nose and to criticize? To look down your nose and to complain? To look down your nose and not to associate with people? Why? Because they have become so religious... that nobody can measure up to their godliness. And Jesus enters in. He says, I'm not preaching to the multitudes. I'm talking to you right here, her in the house. Who are we supposed to be ministering to? I mean, what is this thing all about anyway? Yes, it's about, I found Jesus. Now, we say that Jesus, you know, found me, and, and uh, that's a good thing. But I love the fact that Jesus says, I, I will leave the 99 for the one, and I'm glad that, that I'm the one that he found. Why did he find me? Why? So that I can be the exact same thing that he was. That no matter what I go through, I'm leading people to the cross. It's part of our mission statement here at the church. You see our, our pictures that's up by the coffee on the wall. That's our mission statement. We saved a seat for you. Come as you are. No perfect people allowed because this is what we know. You cannot get into the, the, the physical presence of God truly. You cannot get there and not be changed. You can play games with God, but you can't get into the very presence of God and not change. And so this is what we know. Found people, found people, found people, found people. What do we do? Fi found people, find people. And the Word of God tells me that what am I? I am a priest. Not a priest with a little collar that we've gotten so messed up with. It says, I am a priest. And what is the job of a priest? Every one of us are called to be a, a royal priesthood, a holy nation as a church. What is our job? I am a priest. And I... I, not anybody else, I do it and you do it. We do it as individuals. I set up a place for God and man to meet. We are to love people. See, I love this in Matthew 23, 36. They were trying to, the religious leaders were trying to trap Jesus. And they asked him this in verse 36. Teacher, which is the greatest commandment in the law? And Jesus being so wise, he says this. This is the greatest commandment. Love the Lord God with all of your heart. All of your heart. Everything that you've got. It's a living sacrifice. You don't get to pick or choose. Love the Lord God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your mind. How do I love God with all of my heart, my soul, and my mind? You put everything you've got into that, and you quit playing games with the world. You quit playing games with God. You don't say I'm 50% in and I'm 50% out. You walk in and say, God, I'm 100% in your presence. I'm 100% giving you a sacrifice of praise. Are we perfect enough to do that? No. Can we do it? Yes. How? By the work of the Holy Spirit that is working in us. It is acknowledging the fact daily, I cannot do it on my own. I've got to have God working on my side. I've got to have the Holy Spirit working in me. And Jesus replied, love the Lord God with all of your heart, soul, and your mind. But he didn't stop there. He goes on with that commandment. And he says this, 
This is the first and the greatest commandment. And the second is like this. Love your neighbor as yourself. What's the greatest commandment? Love God, love people. What's the greatest commandment? Love God, love people. The vertical always impacts the horizontal. We can never get this right if we don't get this right. Why do marriages fall apart? Because this is not right. We don't get this right. Our marriage will never be right. Why are our kids falling apart? It's because something here is not right. And when this is not right, this is not right. Why am I having problems on the job with everything that I do? Well, when this isn't right, this is not right. Why are my finances out of whack? Why? We can ask this question all over the page. And every answer to everything that we need is between the pages of this book. God's given us the answer. And if we will learn to apply what we read, if we will learn to apply what we study, if we will learn to apply these principles, it is amazing what God will do in our lives. The vertical always impacts the horizontal. It always does. So we go on and it says this, verse 10. Two men went to the temple to pray. One was a Pharisee. What was a Pharisee? Good guy. Who is the good guy? He represented religion. He was dressed right. He looked right. He smelled right. He knew everything there was about the law. He knew everything there was about the temple. The good guy is kind of like the pastor. The good guy, the Pharisee, is kind of like the the church leader, the deacon, the Sunday school teacher, whoever it may be. And there was a Pharisee who is supposed to be the good guy, represents all the good things. And then there's a tax collector. I'm not sure if there's an equivalent to what a tax collector would be, but a tax collector would, would be more like somebody that's involved in the mafia. You know? I mean, the mafia couldn't be a reliable witness in court. Right? It's almost like the tax collector could be identified as a drug dealer who's selling drugs to all the neighborhood kids. You know, it just, it doesn't make sense. The tax collector, as you look at it, the tax collector was a thief, basically. He was a Jew working for the Romans who have came in and oppressed the Jewish people. And he's working for the bad people, collecting taxes for the Romans. Not only is he collecting taxes for the Romans, He's padding his own pocket and becoming rich. And so Jesus is telling this story to this group, and he's using a good guy and a bad guy. Now, it doesn't matter if you've ever heard this story before. You know this story. It's the good guy versus the bad guy. You know the story. It's Luke Skywalker and Darth Vader. I mean, you know the story. It's Jim and Dwight in the office. You know the story. It is 11 and the monster in the upside down in Stranger Things. You know the story. It's Chuck Norris and any idiot that tries to take him on. You know the story. It's the good cop, bad cop. And this is what the religious leader does. Jesus goes on in verse 11. He walks into the church, okay? He walks into the temple. He walks into the visible presence uh, presence of God. And this is what happens. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed. He stood by himself and prayed. Why did he stand by, by himself and pray? Because he's too good to pray with anybody else. You're not as smart as me. So I'm going to separate myself. You're not as good as me. I'm going to separate myself. Uh, My clothes are clean. You're a little bit nasty. If you touch me, I'm going to become as nasty as you. So he stood by himself and prayed. The Pharisee stood by himself and prayed. He prays this. God, well, he got that one right. God, I thank you that I'm not like other people. Well, could be a good prayer. I, I, I kind of think that sometimes. God, I'm, I thank you that I'm not like that. You know, could, let's go on. He says that I'm not like other people. 
And then he begins to point fingers. The robbers, those evildoers, those adulterers, and even that filthy, no good for nothing, sap sucking, dog faced Chinese, bow legged weevil, hunk jawed, him a Wabian tax collector. <laughs> See, we can just throw all, all the words in there, can't we? Oh, he was disgusted. I thank you that I'm not like him. Thank you that I'm not like him. Here's the problem. Because this is what I do, God. I fast twice a week. And I give a tenth of all I get. Okay, God, pat me on the back. Isn't that, isn't that how it is? His prayer was all about me, 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 me. Yes. But I do not like them because I'm so good. It's almost like he wants a, I, I fast twice a week and I want everybody to know it. And I give my tenth, tink, tink, tink. And I want everybody to hear it when I give. He is righteous. He follows all the rules. See, there's a problem when you get in front of people and you can only tell the good that you've done. I've never smoked, drank, cussed, or chew, and I don't know what girls that goo do. You know, it's, it's, when we have to brag on ourselves constantly, there may be something wrong when it's all bragging because all the fingers are going here. It's all about me. It's all about how good I am. I've never drank. I've never screwed up. I've never had sex outside of marriage. I've never, I've never messed up. God, look how good I am. And there's a problem when we, when we bring all the attention to ourselves, and it's called pride. I hate to tell you this, and there's people that don't like it when I preach this, and there's people that argue when I preach this, but all of us in this place, like it or not, you are a sinner, and if you've received Jesus Christ, you are a sinner saved by grace. It's a sinner saved by grace. A lot of people don't like that issue of being called a sinner, but it reminds us of what God did. That's the reason why it's recorded in the gospel for us to identify ourselves that way. Who was I? I was lost. Who was I? I was helpless. Who was I? I was a sinner lost without the presence of God in my life. But God found me in the middle of my mess. God found me in the middle of my situation. God found me in the middle of my screw up. And God began to untangle me. And I walked into a real relationship with him. And he untangled the sin in my life. And what am I now? I am saved by grace. But this religious leader, he's praying and he's reminding God, I do, all the th I do everything right. God, remember, I do everything right. I follow the rules. I know all of them. There's 613 of them. And you may be proud of me that I know that. But not only did he know that, he lived those out every day of his life with perfection, those laws with perfection. And he's bragging on himself. And basically, the, this is what he's saying. God, I want you to look at me. God, look at me. God, look at my action. God, look at the things I do. God, I want you to know, compared to them, compared to that sinner, compared to those, those dirty, rotten scoundrels, God, I'm good compared to them. Isn't that right? This is the problem with the Pharisee. The Pharisee wasn't completely wrong. But instead of realizing that he, what he had is a gift from God, he began to view himself as a gift to God or as a gift from God. And when he walked in to any place, it was all about the show. Look at me, look at me, look at me. I am God's gift to you. So in a sense, he's saying in his religious spirit, his pride, worship me, worship me, because I don't do anything wrong. 
You know what the problem with pride is? It's a whole lot easier to see in others than it is to see in ourselves. Isn't it? The right of pride will destroy you if you are not careful. The right of spiritual pride will kill you spiritually if you don't bring godly change in your life. And when you study this thing on pride, it is interesting that pride is really classified as the original sin. It was the original sin that Lucifer brought into the world. It was pride that introduced us to everything that we go through, everything that we fight with, everything that that ties us up and tangles us up is from a result of pride. Pride, when Lucifer in a third of heaven was all kicked out because of pride and everything that follows is because of this. I want to give you three things just really quick of what spiritual pride falsely promises. It falsely promises self-sufficiency. I've got this. I've got this. I can do this. I can do this on my own two feet. I can do this on my own power. I got this. I got this. I got this. So many times in my ministry, I have seen this. When people fall apart, they come to church. When their marriage is broken, they come to church. I can remember when the airplanes flew into the Twin Towers. We couldn't keep people out of the church. We had to have specialized services just for people to come in because they were worried, they were broken, they thought that that the outside was coming in to take us over and all the church was open and all the broken people come in. But it is amazing as soon as the clouds begin to break and the sun begins to shine in to whatever it may be, how fast people forget about God. How fast they forget about church. How fast they forget what salvation truly is all about and what it means. Self-sufficiency says this, I got this and I don't need anyone else. I don't need the church telling me what to do. I don't need Christians telling me what to do. I don't need my parents telling me what to do. I sure don't need my kids telling me what to do. I've got this. I don't need you telling me what to do. I got this. I can do this. It also promises self-importance. Pride says, I'm valuable. Because I'm so good, church can't do without me. Do you know how much I give in my tithe? If I just quit giving or if I go somewhere else, you're going to go under. Because it's all about what I give. When I walk in the door, the church is blessed with my presence. And when I walk out the door, the church hurts because I'm gone. (laughs) Self-importance. Pride makes you think you're more than what you are. I'm valuable. I live in the right neighborhood. I drive the right car. I have the right brand name. I host the right teams. I have the right friends. I've got the right labels. I am the glue that makes everything hold together. And the third thing is this, self-exaltation. It says, I'm better. I'm better. And this was the Pharisee's problem. He looked at what he had. He looked at what he had come, uh, accumulated and what he had accomplished in his life. He looked at himself as being better than anybody and everybody else. And he says, I am better. I'm better. I've got it all together. And they don't. Do you understand that an inward direct emotion is something that leads to an outward direct action? When I was, uh, I can't remember what grade it was, somewhere between 7th and ninth, I was at Amarillo Christian School, and Mom took me to Colbert's Harry Holland. Now, anybody old remember Coverts Harry Holland? It was the Dillards of the day, wasn't it? It was, it was the place to go. And mom took me to Coverts Harry Holland, and I walked in, and they had, don't anybody gasp, air, okay? They had bell bottom, and not just little bell bottom, 
big bell bottom, corduroy, tan <laughs> pants. And I can remember walking in and putting those pants on and looking in the mirror going, oh, dude, oh, dude, you got your woman catching pants on now. I went home. It gets worse. I went home. And I put those corduroy bell-bottom pants on with my one-inch platform shoes. And if that wasn't bad enough, I had a shirt that looked like a pirate shirt. Big, puffy sleeves. Big, puffy. I think the puffy sleeve matched the puffy pants. And when I walked out and I saw myself walking out, well, you can tell by the way I use my walk. I'm a woman's man. No time to talk. Do, do, do. How you doing? It was amazing that just those corduroy pants with the bell bottoms created such a difference in my life. And all of a sudden, that inward direct emotion that led to an outward directed action like, oh boy. Baby, yeah, you want some of this. <laughs> Isn't that amazing how some, something like that works? Sometimes we fall into the trap of thinking that my ultimate value is based. <laughs> so, <laughs> oxygen, somebody, oxygen. Sometimes we fall into a trap of thinking that my, my ultimate value is based on my accomplishments. We think that my ultimate value is based on my bell-bottom jeans. We think that the ultimate accomplishment is based because I followed the rules. But really, it's all about the comparison that we make to others. So we need to be very careful how we judge the Pharisee because there may be a Pharisee in all of us. Be very careful how we judge him. But there's another kind of pride that I want to talk about for a moment that a lot of times people fall into and they don't mean to, but it's another type of a pride that people fall into. And it's called a reverse spiritual pride. It is a sneaky pride that kind of sneaks into our life. And if we're not careful, we will become as bad on this end as they are on this end. And this reverse spiritual pride, it, it, it comes into, the, in, into play like this. You don't know how to take a compliment. Oh, you're so pretty. Oh, I'm ugly. Oh, I love your hair. This mess. Oh, I love what you've got on. It's a hand-me-down. Well, you look like a burst of sunshine this morning. I'm a nightmare. You know, it, it, it sneaks in in this reverse way where you can't take a compliment. That's beautiful. It was on sale at Walmart. You just, you can't take a, it, it's a form of reverse pride where you get in church and you look at everybody else that's raising their hands under worship and you go, I could never do that. I could never worship like that. Why? Why can't you worship? Well, if you only knew where I came from. If you only knew my past. I can't raise my hand. My dad beat me as a kid. I, I, I can't raise my hand because we don't have any money like they have. It's a reverse pride that it always sneaks into your life and it says, I can't do what everybody else does because I'm not good enough. Sometimes it sneaks in and it's just the, whoa, it's me. I'm from the wrong side of the tracks. I don't have an education. I, I deserve better. I just don't have better. And it's just a reverse pride that sneaks in. And it's a prideful spirit that enters in from an enemy that only wants to kill, steal, and to destroy. And no matter which pride you're looking at, it all starts with me. I, 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 I. The value is still based on me. So what would Jesus untangle? Number one, write this down. When we are full of ourselves, there's no room for God. 
When we are full of ourselves, there's no room for God. There's a God's side void in every one of us that can only be filled by God. I believe that's how we were made and how we were created. It can only be filled by God. And there's so many times we try to fill that thing with so many different things. We, we cram addictions into it, trying to fill it. We cram, we cram sex into it, trying to fill it. We cram pornography into it, trying to fill it. We cram all of this stuff into that, trying to fill that void. And every time we cram the things in there that's not of God, it leaves just an emptiness and an ache and a an hurt. And when that is gone and that is worn out, the things of the world will leave us empty. Real quick, Eddie Murphy was on the Tonight Show one time years and years and years ago, and they were interviewing Eddie Murphy, and they was asking this question about all the money that he had made, and, and he had made it, uh, what was the name of the show that, uh, oh, I can't remember, but anyway, he had made it, and he had made it, I was going to go somewhere else, but we're not going to go there, he had made it in all these different areas, he had made it on TV, he had made it in movie, he had made it in comedy, he had even cut a couple of albums, I don't think they were any good, but he made a lot of money there, and he had made all this money, and they were asking him, the, 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 the host asked him this question, is there anything you can't have? And he said the most interesting thing on live TV, he said, I can have any house that I want. I can buy any car that I want. I can have any type of a lifestyle I want. And he even went on to say, I can have any woman that I want. And then he looked at the guy and he says, but there's still something missing. There's still something missing. There's a God-sized void in all of us that can only be filled by God. And when we fill that God void and it becomes full of God, it is amazing that that, that will change your life. That satisfaction, it brings a change. It'll change your life. It'll change your heart. It'll change your mind. It'll change your actions. When that void is full of God and you get you, we get me, I get I out of the way, it changes my marriage. It changes my kids. It changes my friends. It changes the friends that I hang out with. It changes my ministry. It changes my view. It changes how I look at things and what the outcome is that I want when that God-sized void void is, is full of God. It changes everything. Look at this. Jesus shows us a different way. Look at verse 13. But the tax collector, now we're looking at the bad guy, but the tax collector standing some distance away, he didn't feel worthy. He didn't just bolt in and all fingers at him. He, he felt not worthy. It says, the tax collector, standing some distance away, was even unwilling to lift his eyes up to heaven. You know what you call that? Guilt. You know what you call that? Pain. You know what you call that? Hopelessness. We have people all the time that walk into our church like that. They, they come in from broken places and broken things, and they, they just they walk in with their head down and a long face. That's why the word of God says that Jesus says, I am the lifter of your head. This man came in and he couldn't even lift his eyes up to heaven. But he was beating his chest saying, God, God, he acknowledges that he can't do it on his own. He acknowledges, I am broken. He acknowledges, I am hurt. He acknowledges, I am tangled up in a mess. I am a sinner and I need grace because I have right now is disgrace and I just need grace. He says he's beating his chest saying, God, be merciful. Give me what I don't even deserve. But God, I'm crying out. Be merciful to me. And he acknowledges his problem, sin. He acknowledges it, sin. The bad guy gets it when the good guy don't. The tax collector's difference. He's standing at a distance. He's got his head down. And this is what Jesus says about him in verse 14. Jesus says, I tell you, he's talking to the crowd, this man, which man? The sinner. Which man? The tax collector. Which man? The helpless. Which man? The hurt. Which man? The man that didn't think he was worthy. 
but all he knew is God was his resource and God was his help. That's all he knew. I tell you this, this man went to his house justified rather than the religious, the other one. For everyone who exalts himself, I'm better, I'm better, I'm better than everybody else. I dress better, I smell better, I I look better, I talk better. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. Day's coming, will be humbled. But he who humbles himself will be exalted. And Jesus is telling this group of people that have become so religious, looking down their noses, Jesus was telling them, this man is different than every one of you that's in this place because every one of you are caught up in your own situations and he just got caught up in God. Second thing is this. When we empty ourselves, we're in the perfect position to be filled by God's grace. See, there comes a time and a place that we just got to be emptied before God. We just got to be emptied before God. Every time I do this, people panic. Don't panic, okay? But emptying is literally being poured out. It's where we are, we are emptying ourselves. It will dry. It's okay. It will dry. <laughs> but it is emptying ourselves. It is being poured out. It is something has got to go. The vessel has got to empty. It has got to be poured out. It is when we empty ourselves. It is when we get to the place where sin is gone. It is when we get to the place where addiction is gone. It is where we get to the place where we say, God, take my pain. God, take my hurt. God, take my anger. God, take all of this stuff that is in me. God, I am emptying myself out. I am laying myself on at the foot of the cross. God, I am relying on you. It is mercy. It is grace. It is love. It is forgiveness that I have to have in my life. God, I am emptying myself. It is like peeling back the layers of an onion. Might make you cry. But the more you peel back, the sweeter that onion gets. It looks better. We want to get to the good stuff. And layer by layer, it's like pulling it back. Yeah, there may be tears that come. There may be some crying that is involved. A lot of times when we're peeling, we look at things and we go, how do do I fix this? You don't fix this. But there's so many times that we take it upon ourselves. I've got to do this. 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 This is a question. Did God tell you to do this? 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 Or did you just think, I need to do this? I need to do this. I need to do this. See, whenever we take God out of the question, out of the equation, it always is about me. I. I have to be broken. And I have to be conformed into the image of Christ And so what would he untangle? He would untangle the spiritual pride. The third thing is this. When we empty ourselves, we're in a perfect position to be used by God. Filled by God and then used by God. Do you know how valuable you are to this church? Do you know how valuable you are to this church? I get several things all the time from people. And I'm going to go ask the musicians to come on up. I I get several things all the time from people. This is what I get. I want to be used in the church. I want to be used in the church. I want to be used in the church. let Let me help you. What do you need help with? Let me help you in the church. Let me, let me help you step up to the plate. Let me help you uh, do whatever. And the moment that I go, okay, I need help, they're nowhere to be seen. The moment I need help, oh, give me three months because I just started a new job. Give me, give me a few weeks because financially I'm in a place I'm having to work another job. So I don't have time to give you what I want to give you. Do you know how valuable you are to the church? I have found something out. 
If you want anything done, go find the busiest person in the world. The one that's doing 500 things and they'll usually step up at the plate and say, I don't know if I really have time, but I'll be there. And Tuesday rolls around and they're there. Use what you got. Use what you got. Be filled by grace. And when we empty ourselves, God will use you by his grace. Don't catch yourself in a place of saying, I'm not smart enough. Don't catch yourself in a place of saying, I'm not good enough. I'm not smart enough. Don't catch yourself saying, what if somebody asks me a question and I don't have the answer? <laughs> kind of means you're human. <laughs> don't, don't catch yourself doing that. But I'm going to challenge this church to do something with me. The 25th of this month, I'm going in for shoulder surgery and I'm going to be out of whack for a little bit. And I've got an incredible staff that is going to step up to the plate and they're going to do some things. And we're lining some things out right now. So I'm going to kind of be with a pillow. Hamid knows how it is. I'm going to be with a pillow under my arm. I'm going to be out of commission a little bit. But you know what I know? You have everything that is needed to make this ship float. Yes, yes. You've got to understand something. I can't live without Steve Husted and Etta. My life doesn't exist without you guys. I can't live without Talmo, Jenny, can't, Jennifer. I can't live with, I can't, I can not. I can't. Steph and Rob. I mean, I can, I can go down the line Dr. Ruiz and Hoser. I can't, I can't, I can't separate my life from you guys. So right now, this is kind of what I'm asking as I get to the end of this thing. I'm going to ask for help. I'm going to ask you for you to step up to the plate and help me. Because this is what I know. I'm going to have about a bad month. And during that bad month, People are going to come into our church through the front doors that are broken. We're going to have somebody walk through the front door of that church that needs to know Jesus. We're going to have to have somebody that walks into that door that you may have to go lay a hand on their shoulder and you may have to kneel down with them and you may need to pray with them. I'm going to ask... And, I, and we've got an incredible church. We do. We have an incredible church. But I'm going to ask that the Pharisee that is in all of us, in the name of Jesus, leaves. And that maybe the tax collector that humbled himself before God and begged for mercy and begged for grace, I'm going to ask for all of those who will just say, I'm ready to do whatever needs to be done to make it happen. So over the next couple of weeks, we're going to lay out some new things that we're going to be trying to do. And this is all I ask. This is all I ask. Be obedient to what I believe God has called us to do as a church. And as we honor God, God is going to honor us. You see, I end with this. I'm going to put this on the screen. Pride is about my glory. Humility is about God's glory. Can we as a church totally and completely just humble ourselves, humble ourselves before God? And just like the tax collector, can we walk in and say, God, here I am. God, have mercy on me. Have mercy on me. And let that mercy flow out of me. That the overflow will touch people's lives. Amen?
that the overflow will minister to people, that the overflow will just love people, that the overflow, that the overflow, pressed down, shaken together, and running over will affect everything. Because this is what I know. God didn't call us to this place to be an island that is isolated from everybody else. God called us to this place. We don't even know where we are. We don't know if we're Amarillo or Canyon. So we call ourselves Camarillo. But God has called us here to be a beacon of hope. God has called us to this place to be a lighthouse. God has called us to this place to be a difference. So this is our, pr- our prayer. Pride, go away. Amen? Pride, go away. Religious spirit, go away. And let me be filled by the very presence of God. Will you stand with me? Father, we love you and we give you all the praise and the glory. And Father, today as we dove into the word of God, I believe that this message was intended for each and every person that has come into this place. God, I pray that today that nobody was here by accident, but it was a divine appointment. And you have been ushered in by the very presence of God to hear this message. Because God, I think that the time is near and our days are are few. I believe that, that the rapture is right around the corner. I believe that the time of change for our lives is now. We don't have time to wait, but it is time to put our hand to the plow and it is time to be to 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 reap a harvest. So Father, I pray that that the anointing of the Holy Spirit will rest upon each and every life that is in this place. That God, I pray that you will begin to draw people to this place from the north, the south, the east, and the west. Father, I pray that you'll bring those that that know how to lead, but Father, I pray that you'll bring those who are broken. And Father, I pray that as a church, we will build as we honor God and do what you have called us to do. And that is we create a place, a safe place for God and man to meet. So Father, I pray that as we leave this place today, let this story permeate in our heart and in our mind to a place that true change comes that we understand, God, something needs to be emptied out because it keeps me from being my very best when I stand in your presence. So God, here I am. I'm humbling myself at the foot of the cross. I'm humbling myself before you and I'm emptying myself out today. And Father, this is my prayer as I empty myself out. I don't want to cram worldly things back in, but I want to be filled by eternal godly things. So Father, fill me, fill me, fill me, fill me. And when you do, use me that I can make a difference. Thank you for watching Family Worship Center's YouTube channel. And we pray that this message was able to speak into your life. Now, don't stop right there. Share this with your friends and family. And you can also subscribe on the link below so you don't miss a single video. And also, there's a link that if you want to support our ministry. Thank you again, and may God bless you.